I promise we'll get to PC building at some point, but first something that can only be described as arts and crafts. This is a semi-tutorial on how to turn literally any case into one with a clear side panel with relatively little effort and on a very low budget. The acrylic sheet I will be using in this video I purchased from B&Q here in the UK. For those of you who aren't familiar with the brand, it is what can be best described as a chain hardware and DIY store. In other countries, it goes by the name Brico, Castorama, Coctash and a few others. For anyone in the US, I'm guessing it's sort of like Lowe's. Because these stores work directly with the public and you can browse the aisles yourself, oftentimes you'll find discounted or damaged items. The piece of acrylic I'll be using today was supposed to retail for £44 but I got it for a whopping £2 because of a broken off corner. Apart from that it was perfect. Because it is such a big sheet this is the third PC I'll be putting a clear side panel on and I reckon I still have one or two more to go until I run out. After tracing out the side panel outline I will use the least elegant cutting method by scoring the piece of acrylic with my knife. A better way of doing this is using a slow metal saw as it creates a far better edge or if you really want to go for it then a hot wire will be best. The reason I went for scoring and breaking is because I don't want to create a lot of debris in my little office. I will be moving soon and in the new place I will have a better shed where I will be able to do these things properly. Regardless for now I will have to stick to lower end PCs because with this method I can't guarantee a perfect edge. Yes you can oversize it a bit and sand it down but again it's not practical indoors. At this point you might be wondering how exactly this will go on the side of the PC. Well I found that the easiest way to do this is to identify 4 tooling holes that you are sort of the right size for a motherboard standoff. I'm guessing that by now you kinda got the gist of where I'm going with this. Using a self tapper you can very precisely increase the hole diameter to suit the standoff and don't worry in case you mess up and go just a bit too wide, you can always thread the second standoff on the other side and it will be secure. Repeat this 3 more times and you are done. The next step is to carefully fuff about the piece of acrylic until you are happy with it and it's looking good and then proceed to mark all 4 standoffs. I use a hot soldering iron to punch a hole through the acrylic as I found that using a drill has about a 20% chance of cracking the acrylic and then you need to start all over again. Most likely using a better drill with a better drill bit will alleviate that issue but I am using the cheapest possible soldering iron here with a sacrificial tip. I am not planning to use this tip to do any actual soldering anymore because even after a good sanding and tip hitting it's still a bit rubbish. And that is more or less it. The case has now a brand new clear side panel and the modifications are 100% reversible. You can optionally add some rubber standoffs but this time I opted not to and anyway it's high time we get to some actual PC building in this video. I will start this build off by applying some thermal paste on top of the Ryzen 2400G that is pre-installed into this Asus Prime A320MK motherboard. I keep saying I will use cheaper paste on low power CPUs and APUs but I just can't bring myself to do it so a couple of MX4 squares later the stock cooler goes in. Please don't judge me for using the stock cooler on this one. I assure you it is enough and then some on a motherboard that does not allow any overclocking whatsoever. Well that might have been a little wild lie because the RAM I'll be using consists of two 8GB sticks of DDR4 rated for 2400 Mbps. No they are not part of the same kit but they do play nice together and work flawlessly at 2800 Mbps with 1.35 volts with looser timings and 1.38 volts with super tight timings. So I don't really have anything to complain about here except to admit that this is technically overclocking. The pre-installed PSU is well not great. It will have no issues with an APU and a couple of LED lights but for anything more than a 1050 Ti it will require an upgrade. Good then I guess that I am planning on including for free in this build. Thankfully the GPU shortage is finally coming to an end so this PC would make the absolute best platform for something like a 1066GB which can now be picked up for as little as £50 as opposed to the 200 plus or so when they were selling a few short months ago. Regardless my intention for this build is to be GPU less so that point is smooth. I wish I had remembered to change the fan with a less audible one. It's not broken or on its way out or anything, this is just how this PSUs come from a factory. It just irks me a bit that this is the loudest component in the system. Another thing that keeps this PC price tag down is the fact that although the Ryzen 2400G is part of the second gen family, the core inside is Zen 1. 
which means that it needs some tweaks for Windows 11 to install. It's a ridiculous artificial limitation in my view that is entirely arbitrary to boot because when it suited Microsoft they quickly made an exception for a few Intel i7 CPUs from the 7th generation just because it so happened that they used them in the first party devices that are still supported. And now finally some bling, in this case courtesy of a real long strip of 5 volts USB powered LEDs. I originally wanted to have them powered using the internal USB header, but as it turns out on cold boot, i.e. first time you plug in the PC, you will need to cycle the controller by unplugging and plugging it back in, so I relented and used one of the USB ports at the back for easy access. This is only necessary when you physically unplug the PC from the main, so it's not that much of an inconvenience to be fair. And here we have some pictures of the final article. You'll notice I did not permanently attach the RGB strip everywhere and solder it in place as I usually do and this is mostly down to the fact that I could not make up my mind on how to root it. So I simply gave up and left the door open for someone else's interpretation. I already ran a very short suite of benchmark this time because the video was in danger of becoming too long and well I benchmarked this particular APU before so if, if you are interested I will have a link in the description to one of the other videos. But heaven I ran twice. One once using my own boot media where I forgot to set the power options to balance as it was a power saver and a second time on a clean windows install. Both results were within margin of error showing once again that heaven doesn't really care what CPU you use as long as the GPU is doing its job. I really wanted Horizon Zero Dawn for the updated benchmark run because last time I tried it on an APU it did not have the benefit of FSR. This time around I left the resolution at full HD but employed FSR balance to increase the frame rate, netting us 33 FPS in the benchmark. Naturally during gameplay it would mostly always be higher than that, in some instances considerably higher as this is the worst case scenario. Dropping down to native 720p will increase the frame rate by about 9 fps taking it to over 40 on average but with a noticeable hit to sharpness. Yes a 1060 will do wonders here but until that comes along this is good enough for you to enjoy the game. I chose to run Fortnite on performance mode. Yes it can go to medium settings but again I've already done that in a previous video so I thought this would provide a bit more value. The frame rate is a bit all over the place but it does stay above 60 fps and at times it roughly doubles that so depending on the monitor setup I'll probably cap it at 60 with vSync and play the game that way. Technically the final average came to 109 fps but going unlocked means you need to contend with frame time spikes. And finally the last game on today's benchmark roster is Assassin's Creed Valhalla. Why? Because again it is one of the games that has received massive updates in the interim since I last played it on an APU, so I wanted to see how it behaves now, especially since it supports FSR, which as I understand it is a fairly new addition. Dropping everything to low and setting FSR to balance we got a playable 35 FPS. For an exploration game this is not half bad, but I'll be honest it could do with a smidge more eye candy. And that's it for today. This was a bit of a different video, but I hope you enjoyed it nonetheless.